Hi everyone, how's everyone doing? Good, it's almost over. Um, so yeah, I'm, uh, I'm from the University of Hertfordshire. Uh, my project is uh, the in vitro modeling of the lungs response to environment, environmental nanoparticulates. Um, so first, just gonna go over the contents of what I'm gonna be talking about. Uh, I'm gonna go briefly over the background of sort of the lung, uh, the lung structure. Um, and why particulate matter is important. I'm gonna go over some of the current models and their limitations, uh, the aims of the project, experimental methods, analysis, and some of the future work. Okay, so why is particulate matter important? Well, particulate matter describes a wide variety of airborne materials. Uh, they come from both human activity and natural uh, sources, such as burning fossil fuels and uh, volcanic eruptions. And they can be direct, directly emitted into uh, the air as pollution, uh, of which at least one billion people a year um, inhale this polluted air every day and can cause uh, development of respiratory diseases. Um, so yeah, you've probably seen this before, or probably not, I don't know. Um, but basically, in the smallest of terms, you, uh, the larger the particle, the higher up the respiratory tract it gets stopped um, and deposits. Uh, but what I'm going to be focusing on is the alveolar region. Um, and this is mainly governed by Brownian diffusion. Um, and I'm particularly uh, interested in the nanoparticle range of this uh, process. So the current gold standard for toxicity testing um, is animal models. Uh, this is usually respiratory uh, inhalation studies uh, done rodents, um, but they have their set of limitations, even though they've been used for at least 100 years now uh, to test toxicology. Um, the main sort of sets are they're quite expensive. They have a set of ethical issues, but mainly they're not representative of human physiology um, and they have issues scaling if you're doing any sort of drug um, administration. Uh, one of the sort of alternatives to this sort of uh, testing is using monoculture, so cell culture. Uh, but again, they're not very representative because of the submerged um, conditions, uh, which is an, an air-liquid interface, and they're usually a single cell uh, based uh, model. So my aims are specifically to develop a better understanding of nanoparticle toxicology, um, with the aim of producing a predictive standalone in vitro model, uh, with hopefully reducing the amount of uh, animal models required for these sort of testing. So previous work that was uh, performed by our group uh, looked at the in vitro characterization of vacuolated alveolar macrophages and the response to sort of drug exposure. Um, and what they used was high content fluorescent imaging to uh, quantify cell viability, morphometric changes, and other, other relevant endpoints. Um, and these morphometric changes can be seen through different sort of intrinsic and extrinsic factors. Uh, but what we found is that um, they can potentially be used to uh, safely look at toxicity of uh, drug administration to uh, macrophages. Um, and if you look here on the, on the right, you can see that different uh, drugs that have been used have shown to have uh, different morphometric changes on these cells. Um, I don't really know if you can see that very well, but I see it, so that's what's important. <laughs> um, so experimental methods, uh, which is building on this sort of premise. Uh, I have grown some cells in a flask I've then transferred them into a 96 volt plate uh, and exposed them with a range of nanoparticles over a range of concentrations, left them in an incubator overnight, um, and then performed a cell health assay, which is a cocktail with different fluorescent labels, which looks at different parts of uh, morphometric changes that I want to uh, see within the cell. Um, so what you can see here is that you've got Different color stains, uh, the nucleus staining, which just stains the DNA, uh, image at dead green, which is a uh, 
plasma membrane permeability stain. So if the plasma membrane is compromised, uh, there's more green that you can see. Um, and it's a sort of indication of cell death. Uh, you've got mitotracker red, which looks at mitochondrial activity, and cell mask, which is a, another plasma membrane uh, stain, but this sort of stains the entire cell. And, and we're going to be using the blue and purple, apparently, uh, stains to segment the cells in the next step. Uh, so what we do is we get the 96 oil plate, we place it into a fluorescence. That's wrong. We place it into a fluorescence imager, uh, and then it can take multiple uh, images within each well at the same location and then stitch these images together, um, which are then quantified by uh, the accompanying proprietary software, which is called Celeste. Um, which takes the nuclear staining and the cell mass staining and segments the cells uh, so that we can do cell by cell morphometric analysis on each of them. Um, so once I've got all the data, I found that uh, the data had, uh, and I plotted it, the data was skewed. And once I, I also did a, a normality test on it, which is a shapiro wilkes test, um, to confirm this, I then log transformed data to get a log normal distribution and applied a sort of standardization called Z scoring for testing between biological repeats. Um, and to make sure that I can test between the two biological repeats, I performed a student t test, uh, which compares the means and distributions of uh, each of the control wells and looked at the effect size, which uh, quantifies the difference in standard deviation units, determine, determining the uh, practical significance of the findings. And in the majority of cases, you can see that uh, the effect size is relatively small, so I can reject the uh, sort of significant difference that you see in the t-test, which is particularly due to the large quantity of data that I'm getting from these cells. Um, and apart from this, the second uh, uh, well, which is C11, which uh, had a sort of medium effect size, uh, which required me to go back to the cell images to see what is happening. And when I uh, go back to the cell images, I can see that there is a piece of debris within the uh, localized area that I'm taking images in. And depending on the segmentation process uh, and the algorithms used, there are different uh, amounts of cells that it's quantifying. And as you can see, the on the sort of right hand side, the watershed uh, algorithm segments the debris, which is not ideal for what I'm trying to do here. And so there's a possibility of either removing this well from the analysis or uh, trying to mess around with the uh, Celeste program until I can find a way of removing the segmentation issue. Um, so once I've got all the data, uh, I then use principal component analysis, which is a dimensionality reduction uh, method, uh, due to the fact that I have 16 different features that I'm looking at, and I want to be able to visualize and understand the data without uh, sieving through quite a lot of data to get what I need. Um, so I've managed to reduce the 16 features into five principal components. And um, you can sort of see if I, yeah, uh, that there is a sort of dose, dose dependent uh, nature um, with decreasing uh, concentrations of copper oxide, uh, the peak of the uh, sort of distributions over here goes from blue to brown, I guess. Um, and there is a slight shift, but there is no cluster formation, which means I probably need to do quite a lot more um, plates to try and find the difference that I seek. Um, so for future work, there I've split this into a short term and a long term. I'm going to be performing quite a few more batches of plates so that I can compare the biological repeats. Um, and then hopefully identify some key contributing factors through those loadings um, 
and performed something called uh, aggregation of cell uh, single cell data analysis on a population level. Uh, I also be comparing uh, traditional assays such as Presto Blue, which is a viability assay, to this sort of method and relate them together and hopefully go for expression studies for both gene and protein expression. In the long term, I'm looking to <laughs> compare uh, the data found here with a slightly more complex model called the Air Liquid Interface Model, and then hopefully at some point at uh, UKHSA, uh, use the Coltec system, which is an exposure chamber system on those uh, Air Liquid Interface models. Thanks for listening, and I guess I'll take questions.